The Charles River Museum's Tuesday Tech Talk series is made possible by a grant from the Lowell Institute. And by the support of our museum members. To become a member, visit charlesrivermuseum.org slash join. To follow us here on YouTube, click subscribe and hit like if you enjoyed this video. Good afternoon. I'm Isaiah Plavnik, Museum Experience Coordinator here at the Charles River Museum of Industry and Innovation. And I'm here with museum volunteer and longtime friend, Mr. Todd Cahill. Hello. Hello. We're going to be talking today about model steam engines and uh, model engineering. Uh, Todd, you're an expert in this field. Why don't you tell us a bit about yourself? OK. Well, I first started uh, doing model engineering when I was in college. And thereafter, I didn't really know what I was doing. In fact, I was a little intimidated by the whole aspect because I did not have much experience with machine tools or steam engines or what have you. Um, but through coming here, um, getting involved with different groups over the years have uh, made me the expert you called me. You <laughs> think I am. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen your work and we'll see your work later and I think it'll speak for itself. Uh, so this uh, model engineering, is this an easy hobby to get started with or get into? Um, it, it, it is if, it, if that's what you want to do. Um, like I said, when I, was, when I first started thinking about incorporating steam engines into my artwork or what have you, I was, I was almost intimidated to the point that I, I, was, I was afraid of them. And uh, I wasn't thinking of uh, model steam engines. I was thinking of steam engines, great big steam engines like this and great big boilers and dangerous things, you know, or seemingly dangerous things. Um, I had no idea that, that something called model engineering exists. I, I was trained as an artist, so I knew engineering, not model engineering. So when I found out about that, I was like, that's, that's, I need to change the scale or change my scope of things. Um, and, and from there on out, it was, it was, it was as you say, my, it was easy, you know? Right, well, we're going to see some of your work later on. But first of all, since we're here at the museum, why don't we take a look at our collection of model steam engines? Yep. So this is our model steam engine display, part of our power exhibit. Uh, what do you think? It's uh, kind of like seeing old friends. A lot of these were here when I first started um, volunteering here in 1992 and provided a great deal of inspiration in my career and, and endeavors, you know? So, um, they're very now Let's familiar. start here. I know this is, um, this is a kit, right, that you can get online? I think it's either a kit or it's a, um, maybe a, a pre-manufactured uh, engine, um, like a weed, and I think this was actually electrically fired, because it has two electric posts there, so you have a heating element in there. Um, that you could plug into the wall and have a instant steam engine, you know? What we have over here is an, uh, air, is an electrical air compressor right. back there, yep. uh, which we filled up. And let's see what it does for our kit here. So, run there. This one has a bit of a temper. They you, often develop personalities of their own, you know? Can you tell by the noise it's making whether it's so, whether there's a, a fault or a dent or, well, or, or this, what you would call a personality about it? Yeah, I mean there is a there is a somewhere in in the uh, crankshaft here where you can hear that, that slight knocking that if everything was nice and tight. You wouldn't get that, that knocking, that tuck, 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 
could probably take a stethoscope and find out exactly where it is, you know? This one's very well behaved. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you don't hear that knocking like in the other one on the mm -hmm. crankshaft. Yeah. Very, a lot, mm -hmm. lot smoother. Now blue and red here, as I call them, okay. both are both seem to me very, I'm not an engineer, but they seem to me very basic, typical horizontal steam engines. Yep. Most of the type that I see when we host our model engineering show run by the New England Model Engineering mm -hmm. Society. Is this sort of, you know, what, what a typical model engineer starts out with? Um, they basic. say that, that, you know, they usually model engineers start out with with uh, stationary steam engines and then they move on, they graduate to locomotives and so on and so forth. I stopped growing at stationary. I like the stationary engines and I think there's plenty to explore that I, I never really got into the train end of, of, of things, you know? That requires um, a bit more space, I'd imagine. Probably for a track, if you want to have your own track that you run it on. What can you tell us about this type of vertical engine? It's a, a fairly typical um, upright um, engine. Looks like it, it could be like a, a, a marine engine or for a boat or, or of some sort. Um, this one and this one, this is a Stuart Turner. It's got the S on that, and that's a long-standing uh, uh, company in England that still offers to this day castings for probably this very same engine. And that's what a lot of people do in model engineering is buy castings from a company and they machine those and, and make the bits and pieces that will complete a, 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 a running engine, you know, a, a little steam engine. So, um, well, well, this one, uh, I'm not sure about this. This is a bit new on our display. Mm -hmm. This one, you can see it's so small, it has a bit of a hair trigger when it comes to the air. So when you turn it on, there you go. Yep. Gotta be very gentle. You got no load on it. That's yep. why it's going so fast. You know, maybe put a yeah. load on it. Yeah. Slow it down yeah. a little bit. What, what, would, what would you say is the fundamental difference between the model engine and a full-size steam engine, apart, obviously, from scale? <laughs> Um, well, you can't scale steam. St steam doesn't scale, so it can be hard to govern such a small thing because the steam stays the same, you know? Um, so regulating it with a tiny governor regulates it a percentage that is, is, un is usually unaffected um, by such a small uh, imprint, I'll say, that, that a tiny governor would put on it. And also the, the danger involved in the absence of a governor or a malfunctioning governor on a large engine could mean the engine explodes because it can't handle that type of speed if it's not regulated. Mm -hmm. Whereas on a small engine, things aren't going to explode mm -hmm. if it goes too fast. Well, a layman might think that all you need for a smaller engine is less pressure on the steam. Is, but it's, is it a bit more complicated than that? It's a, it's a bit more complicated than that. It, you're not necessarily um, regulating the pressure. You're regulating a percentage of that pressure or a percentage of that volume of steam going into making it into your engine. In practice, does it take, would you, in your experience, more pre-planning and notes and, and calculations of the right pressure, the right speed, or would you say it's more of a hands-on experimental For me, process? it's been a hands-on. From start to finish, you know, it's more of a hands-on, that's how I learned how to, how to do things. You know, that's how I learned how to run a lathe, is by having a lathe, and like I said earlier, making mistakes with that lathe not figuring out how to not make the mistakes in the first place, but just to make the mistakes. Um, and my engineering is sort of a trial and error type of process with, as I, as I have more experience, I, I 
I tend to not make as many mistakes just because some of those are inherent now. You know, they're, they're second nature, if you will. Of course. You know? Right, so we're going to take a look at uh, your shop where the magic happens in a mm -hmm. moment. Uh, but before we go, why don't uh, you do the honors of giving our Buckeye steam whistle oh. <laughs> a bit of a... If only I could do it from across the room yeah. so it wouldn't... Oh, looks uh -oh. like we've used most of the pressure. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to plug it in and do that again? I actually, no, I, I think that's actually quite funny. <laughs> All right, so here we are at your, uh, your shop right around the corner from the museum. And uh, these are some of your steam engines that you've been working on. Yes. Your model engines. Mm -hmm. Tell us about these. So these are, uh, uh, there's a, couple of different uh, eras in my own life. This was made about uh, 15 years ago by me, and it's based on a design called a uh, non-dead center engine. And one of the issues with uh, steam engines at the time, especially in marine applications, were that they were, they were difficult to start without doing what I'm doing, is like giving it a, a motion so that it can, th that the dead, areas in the process of the steam going through the inertia can, the, the inertia of the flywheel can carry it through mm -hmm. but this one when one is at this is at top dead center the other one is not therefore aiding it off of its its dead spot in the cycle so this is at top dead center this is not this is at top dead center this is not mm -hmm. and this is at bottom dead center and this is not and this is at bottom dead center, and this is not. So it was just a way, especially in a marine application, if you were navigating your ship next to a dock or something, you didn't want to be concerned with where your engine was stopped. You wanted to be concerned with where your boat was stopped. Um, therefore, they could start and stop it, and in some cases, reverse it on the fly, you know. So this one doesn't um, look like any of the model ones we have on display. So you're saying this one would have been for a, a, a well, this would be a model of a, a marine steamship engine. Yeah, or, or an engine, it, the way I have it arranged, it doesn't have paddle wheels on it or it's not in, a, in the hull of a boat. Um, it would be in an application, in a stationary application, where starting and stopping an engine might be quite more more frequent than say something in a mill where you start at once in the morning and let it go all day or in a civil uh, engineering like water pump where you start it in March and let it go for 12 years right. you know yeah. can you give us a sense um, so, of scale ratio on this one um, these would be in scale of I don't really use scale in my models right. because I don't really consider them to be models. They are engines in and of themselves. So the scale of the engine is that. It's 100%. <laughs> but an engine like this, if it was in a boat, uh, a person might stand about that tall, you know, or, or, or a little taller, depending on the size of your boat. Now, you mentioned uh, the phrase steam launch, which is a boat. Now, we yep. have... Not a model engine, but a small uh, sure. blue marine engine mm -hmm. at the museum that looks mm -hmm. very much like this one, I noticed. Yep. yep. So this is another client who contacted me to um, customize this, this launch engine mm -hmm. or a, a marine engine. And this is a uh, triple expansion engine that uses steam three times in the cycle. So it starts here high pressure, and you can tell it's high pressure you, it, because it's the smallest one, and it takes less energy, less volume of steam to create this, the same amount of work as in a lower pressure cylinder and an even lowest pressure cylinder And here. you can see the different sizes of the cylinders. Yeah. Correct. So how this works is the steam comes through here first, comes in at I don't know, it could be 120 PSI. And then you partially condense it. On the other side here is a, is a condenser here, which would be, a, it's kind of a reverse radiator in that it, well, or, or like a radiator, it, it cools the steam a certain amount so that it drops the pressure to go into the next one. 
and then it drops it even further to go in into the lowest pressure one. And you want to drop it because you don't want, if you were to take it directly from here and go into here, this would be getting more power than the other one because it's more volume at the same pressure right. and you want it to be equal throughout so you don't put any stresses on your crankshaft. So. Would the flywheel on this one be directly connected to the propeller of a... Correct, there would be a propeller instead of the flywheel yeah. and uh, that's a propeller that he prepared, he, he uh, um, supplied me with. Um, and this is, this is a good example of what a scale isn't necessary, you know, it looks like it would be a scale, you know, if you could imagine this hand wheel as being this size, that might give you an idea of scale, but this could very easily be put in a small canoe or something to power a canoe. The um, actual engine, not... Yeah, no, that engine, yep, yep. Well, we're right near the Charles. <laughs> what are you doing afterwards? <laughs> now, these engines, gorgeous as they are, very recognizable as... Uh, steam engines. This one looks a bit, if you don't mind me saying, like an old school pencil sharpener. Yeah, that's true. If maybe that's why I was always going to sharpen my pencil. <laughs> um, but this is this is another form of steam engine called a, a rotary engine. And instead of having a piston in a cylinder that goes to one end, stops, reverses direction, goes to the other end for you know whatever RPM you have, this is a constantly in the same direction. So the steam is coming in this one, operating via the valve, causes it to come in here, the steam expands, and you can see this chamber getting larger. While it's doing that, it's pushing down on this rolling piston, and then the, the valve will change so that this is now exhausting. So the steam is coming out of this chamber and going into this one, and it's pushing it up. So it causes it to, to roll around this oval type cylinder, you know. It makes for a very smooth running engine because you don't have all those parts reciprocating back and forth, um, causing, you know, weight issues to be thrown all around. This one, supposedly when it's done, will, will tick around like it's, like it's run on by an electric motor, you know? <laughs> is, were, were they, I've never seen an engine like this, were they very common in industrial uh, usage? They, they did have some, some following, but um, there was probably due to uh, complications in manufacturing um, that, that they, they weren't as, as um, um, popular as they, they might be, you know? I, I, I think there's probably also an issue of how much power you can get out yeah. of something like that. I was about to say, I'm not an engineer, but from the way it operates, it seems to me like the chamber would, have, would be taking a great load of stress from the impacts of the piston on each side. Yeah, maybe there, there's also a problem with wearing, how, how much it wears, and also how do you seal the ends of mm -hmm. something like this. And in a model scale, there's all kinds of, you know, you can, you can use or, this yeah. graphited yarn, to pack that ring so that the both ends are sealed. Um, but in a, in a larger application, a, a piston ring, which would be common in a, in a conventional engine, doesn't really work in this, in this application. Maybe if they had waited around for a few hundred years, they would come up with all kinds of ceramics and plastics that could do the trick, but too late. Now this little engine's certainly unusual, uh, but uh... I understand you have something even more unusual to show us. Yep, yep, that's right over here. Oh, goodness. Um, if you could imagine me, instead of walking over and flipping this circuit of uh, a shovel in hand, about to fire coal in the, in, the, uh, in the boiler, this is a substitute for this. And what you hear over there is the hum of the, the, the water pump that is pumping water into the boiler just as a, as a cycle. And, and indoors, on my way to, to monitor the, the electric steam generator, is this boiler that I use outdoors, and which is gas-fired. So um, that's reserved for operating outdoors for, for obvious reasons. <laughs> and this one over here that we're operating indoors today is a as a, a steam generator, electric steam generator. 
and uh, it's kind of a not much to look at. It looks like a, a medical apparatus of some sort. They use these to clean jewelry and stuff like that, or clean dyes. They have a steam gun um, that they, they that they use these with. Um, but it, it it operates very nicely in this type of situation. It's nearly it. Most of it is automatic. I gotta keep water in that bucket, but it'll feed it automatically when it needs it. Uh, so, this engine is probably the earliest engine of, of any that I have made and has survived. Um, it's more of a whimsical piece rather than a serious uh, kind of feat of engineering, um, but it, it, it is uh, tried and tested and true, you know. Um, I've seen this piece at the Steampunk Festival. It's always a big hit, yep. but it's always it fascinated me because the pistons look to a layman, like they're working up against each other, but they're not. They're working in conjunction. No, right? if you if we can slow it down to a certain point, they are actually in conjunction. While this is on the top, this is rotating it around the around the bottom, um, sort of like the the non dead center engine I explained earlier. This one gets steam going out, and when it reaches, it doesn't get any steam going back piston going back in there, but this one is pushing it off. Um, these are oscillating cylinders, which are the very simplest of, of steam engines. It has very few moving parts. Um, the rocking of the cylinders uh, uh, arranges the valve in a way that it receives or exhausts the steam at the right time. Um, these were mostly found in toys because they were simple to make, but they were also um, common in, in marine applications and locomotives had some, some oscillating engines, obviously more uh, complex than, uh, than a, uh, a toy, but uh, Brunel used oscillating of engines in, in his ships. Um, and they would be going very much slower than this. Because, because if you were if you were operating this fast in a boat, you're, you're, that yeah. rocking back and forth would probably do enough to propel your boat forward in a very <laughs> irrational manner. So, you know? What sort of uh, tools and uh, materials have you out, uh, equipped your workshop with to build your your engine? Well, um, this one was made with very simple um, machines. I had a single lathe and a. a um, very rudimentary uh, milling machine and a die filer, was, which is a reciprocating file that formed a lot of these more complex shapes on, on, on this, this part. But a lot of this was made with, with files and, and a very worn out lathe um, and, and um, a, a drill press, you know. Um, since then, I've, I've expanded on this and, and um, you know, I, I kind of cut my teeth making making stuff like this, um, and and learn to to know what I was missing as far as a as a uh, a more um, efficient workshop. So this was all cut out with a jeweler's saw, like a like a little hacksaw that I used to to cut that out. Um, but a lot of it was kind of. Uh, together you know um, I'm just being hypnotized now <laughs> <laughs> oh well you don't want to get too far going one way so we we like to normalize you by having it go oh you can reverse it excellent way. there you go if I notice people leaning too far <laughs> to, the, to the left I, I know it's I'm time to, to, uh, to reverse direction to bring them more on center you know excellent Tell us a little bit about your shop and what, what it takes to, what this place takes to get all the steam engines up and running. So what you see here, and this is 25 years later, um, that it, it's more of a refined shop for, for making the things that I, that I 
want to and need to to make a living. So you see milling machines and lathes and um, drill presses and some CNC equipment, you know, computer controlled equipment. Um, I tend to lean towards either very local in machinery. This is a Wade lathe made about a mile down the road, down River Street in Waltham. There's also a Rivet lathe over there that was made in Brighton, a little further down the road. Um, or I, I like the European style of, of machinery. Like this is a Schoblin lathe, which is a very fine uh, clock maker's lathe or, or, or instrument maker's lathe. Um, very much copied a lot of the, the, the machinery that was made in Waltham at the turn of the last century. Um, and uh, there's some Swiss milling machines. That's a German milling machine, a, a Deckel, which are very, they, they operate a little bit differently. I, th I, I say you, you're a little bit more intimate with the machine. You're a little bit more up close and personal with it rather than just pushing a button right. or being further away from the action. Um, and they're also very, uh, um, they're, they're universal. You can do a lot of different things with it. Um, it just doesn't do one thing very good milling. It, it does indexing, it does gear cutting, it does all kinds of, they're, they're, they're flexible, you know. About on average, how many different machines does it, make, does it take to make one of your engines? <sighs> That's a good question. Um, yeah, it, it, instead of changing a machine uh, or, or changing the arrangement of a machine to do another diff operation, right. I tend to acquire another machine to leave set up. So I have 10 lathes here and Two. three milling machines and sometimes you know a good portion of that percentage of that of those numbers can be used in any given operation well it certainly worked for you and uh, about a month ago we uh, the museum lent you one of our not model engines but uh, a very right. special engine of yep. ours for you yep. to get up and running yep. again yep so do you so, want to show us that yes now this might look a bit large for a model steam engine. That's because it's not a model steam engine at all, is it? No, this is very much a working engine. Um, this was built by George F. Shedd in Waltham, right here in Waltham. On, he had a shop on Lexington Street, and predominantly he made uh, machine tools, or lathes in particular. And his, the reason why you don't hear about George Shedd Lathes, not only was he in, in, in the company of some very fine lathe makers in Waltham, Stark, Wade, Derbyshire, um, Ames was another one, was his met a different market and it, was, it met a market of economy or like, like a cheaper um, lathe than what many of the makers here were, were trying to appeal to. Um, so that probably meant that he had to be a little flexible in what he manufactured and something else that he made were, were steam engines apparently. This was a, a, an engine that was made um, to, for an ice company, the Walker Ice Company in Providence, Rhode Island. And I would imagine the plaques on the other side um, has some information, but it was said it was used on an ice pond and at the time they would, in the winter, obviously, they would let the ponds freeze or let their, the, the ice company's pond freeze and then chop out blocks of ice from the pond, put them on in storage and in, in, surrounded by uh, hay and then ship them down south or ship them out to customers around here. Um, so this might have been used to... Uh, to, to run a saw rig on, a, on an ice pond. Um, when I got it, it had been restored in 1999 by a fella in North Carolina. Edgar J. Torchesny, um, Hickory, and, North Carolina, it says. And he had, 
it seemed like he had gone through it all and, and maybe donated it to the museum afterwards. The, the, the main problem I found was the belt was, had somewhat uh, yeah. become a little <laughs> brittle. <laughs> yes, it so I... Uh, Just broke in your hand, yeah. I, I took some time to find my roll of real leather rawhide uh, uh, belting and spliced it together. It's cut as a skived joint. Right. And then I, I have a little extra here, so I'll just use my little plane to dress that a little bit. Now you've gone the extra mile and actually hooked this up to power a machine. Yep, I have. Today I, I decided to make this somewhat of a historic anomaly by having it run uh, a machine that it would not be able to run anywhere else on the planet, probably. <laughs> um, this was is a traversing head shaper in which the movement usually on a shaper is via the table moves with each cycle of, of this going back and forth. But in this case, the whole reciprocating cutting tool traverses across the workpiece. So it's a bit more like a planer. It's kind of like a planer. Um, a planer moves the bed, under, is the part that the, the, the tool right. reciprocates back and forth underneath the cutting bit. Whereas this, it's kind of like a shaper and a planer. And a planer. Huh. Um, this was, it's kind of an anomaly in and of itself in that it, it looks very much like uh, uh, a Boynton and Plummer traversing head shaper, which was made in Worcester, and they were usually hand cranked. This one is stamped, built by D L D and L R R Scranton, PA, and that's the Delaware and Lackawanna uh, Railroad. So they may have copied loosely the, the Boynton and Plummer patterns and then made it themselves. Um, and maybe it was used in, a, could have been in a caboose or something like, like that, that they would take out and, and be able to, to service some valve or part on the road, you know, if it was indeed a hand cranked um, version of it, you know. And we are going to be running it off of Mr. Shedd's little engine. Yep. All right. So, wherever I see a point that looks like is an oiling point, which is usually a rotating or a reciprocating, and indicated by all these little brass caps. And they might have used oil at this point, but they could have used like tallow or, or um, whale oil, anything thick. Because <laughs> their tolerances were not terribly, uh, they weren't as tight as today's standards. And then you use what's a, uh, it's essentially a, a graphite, graphited oil. Um, for the steam cylinders, and it's kind of sweet smelling. It emotes a nice sweet smell, ambrosia. Um, and it's very thick and black. Is that standard for model engineers? Um, it depends. This is real, genuine antique steam cylinder oil, Ooh. rescued from a old state hospital, I guess. Um, and it is still available. Um, a lot of model engineers might, might use something a little more, um, this is actually, it's not water soluble, but it mixes with the steam really well. So we're showing about 70 PSI on our, on our gauge over there, um, which is pretty good. I'm gonna give that a good dose of oil to start it out with, but I think it should be all right. So you get a lot of condensate, 
when you first run steam engines, the steam hits the cold everything and turns instantly to water. Water doesn't really run through passages like steam is designed to do. Um, so you got to get all that water out of there. You could really ruin a engine by having it um, leaving that water in there. So it should. Likes that oil. It's real smooth. I see what you mean about the smell. Yeah. That's very sweet. There's a reason why these things aren't around anymore beyond like, I don't know, there, there's, uh, you know, aesthetically it's great. I've posted about these engines and, and people are like, oh, if I heard that in the background of my shop rather than the whine of an electric motor, that would be great. But it takes a lot of energy to run the, one of those. It's almost like you need a, a person just to run the engine, never mind what you're trying to do with it which is running this, this shape right now. Mm -hmm. You've got it balanced very well, because I remember when we moved this here, noticing that the most unwieldy part of it was the flywheel. It's very robust. Yeah. A bit balanced over this side, but you've got it up on blocks. It's hardly wobbling at all. Right. No, it's... it's uh, that's one thing uh, that I try to do with my engines is give them a good foundation yeah. um, so that, that the bases on them are not merely direct decorative, they're also very heavy and they're usually made out of cast iron so yeah. that they, they damp vibration. You Which know, is good, than, uh, the number of things that would vibrate in this place yeah. <laughs> would sound like a wind chime factory. <laughs> <laughs> the governor is very unusual. Well, Maybe it isn't, but I've never seen a governor with sort of horizontal springs like that. Yep, that's just to make it a little more, a little less sensitive, so that the springs are actually keeping the balls in. Oh. So it, they don't fly out immediately. So in a small governor, and that's often a problem with model governors, is that they are so sensitive because they're so tiny that it's hard to use them as an actual governor. So you need that that those kind of springs to, of to make them a little less sensitive. Um, I, I, I tried yesterday to really speed it up to see if those, that's flying out a little bit. Oh, wow. So this engine is probably isn't even fully regulated now. So it might, its operating speed for an ice saw um, might be uh, faster than what you're seeing here. And that noise we're hearing, that's not just the piston or the shaper, there's a pump, and you set up a bucket here. Well, it's not um, really the pump, but that's, that's the exhaust. Right. So that's... Would normally be going into like a feed water or a... They, they, they might recirculate the water in this, in something like this, but um, you got to get the oil out of it. Mm. You don't want to pump oil, dirty water, mm. into your, uh, into your um, boiler. I doubt they'd want to pump dirty water onto hot ice. That's <laughs> yes, true, well. too, you know. <laughs> well, well this, this beautiful engine, this beautiful locally made Waltham engine has just been sitting in our storage for ages, and I cannot yeah. thank you enough for getting it up and running again. It really is a privilege to see it in action. Yep. Well, hopefully uh, soon enough we'll have this beauty back on display. Probably not running off of steam, but uh, maybe backwards off an electric motor. I'll sneak some steam in there some, at some point. <laughs> Always welcome to. <laughs> so, Todd, what would you recommend to someone looking to get started in model engineering? Well, when I first started, I would um, 
acquire magazines of the trade, if you will, Live Steam magazine and Home Shop Machinist. And that led me to discover the club NEMS, the New England Model Engineering Society right here that, uh, well, used to meet pre-COVID in Waltham, um, but they meet still uh, virtually every month. And uh, that was a terrific resource in meeting people and finding out about shows um, to display my work and, um, and have traveled all around the Northeast um, to doing, doing model engineering shows or farm shows. Um, and I learned a great deal about, you know, machinery from the, the, the guys that use them, you know, in their own trades or, or in their pursuit of, of uh, their hobbies and stuff. What we have here is the, the quintessential American model engineer's lathe. Um, it's a South Bend lathe made in South Bend, Indiana, and probably better than the shed lathes that we said were meeting an economy, uh, meeting a, a, uh, an economy sale um, for, for guys that could afford it. The South Bend was, was very much along those lines in comparison to, to some um, much more expensive industrial lathes, although these were, were used in an industry. But most of all, South Bend would um, uh, uh, feed the trade schools at the time that kids, so kids would learn how to use lathes on a South Bend lathe. And that's what they, you know, when they, if, even if they didn't go in the trade, they were familiar with a South Bend lathe. And uh, they're, they're a good little lathe and they can be found, you know, quite, you know, predominantly in, on the, in the, the used tool market, you know. And they're easy to equip, they're easy to, to use. Um, so that, that, that's how I started. Not with this particular one, but another South Bend lathe that was, was my first real machine tool, you know. Um. Well, and well, thank you so much for showing us the shop and, uh, and your fantastic engines and for boosting our engine. Yep. But uh, do you have any final words of wisdom you might give to someone, to any aspiring model engineers? Hmm. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Something about patience, maybe watch where you put your thumbs. Yeah, <laughs> your no, beard. yeah, there would, there would be... <laughs> Patience and perseverance, and um, I found like I was at a at a crossroads where I wanted steam engines. I, I I that was something I wanted to to have, and I found it much better to invest in the ability to make a steam engine. Not only because that gives you a skill set, but also you're not afraid of it or you're not intimidated by it. And anything that you break, which inevitably happens, you have the ability to make anew and make afresh. Whereas if I were to pay for these engines, you know, an exorbitant amount, or even if it was, you know, a find, a flea market find or something, you might be intimidated by that because you don't want to ruin your investment, you know. Um, so I found that, that, that there is an added bonus to knowing how to how to make something because you're not you're not afraid of it you know you're not afraid of it breaking and I imagine a great deal of edification as well <laughs> for sure yep 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 well thank you very much you're Todd. welcome thank you for coming my pleasure okay